today about work that's happened over the last three or four years, actually. Um, so it's work to look at uh, the benefits of developments in cross seas. I've got some pops with me, which I'll talk about. But before doing that, I just thought I'd give you a quick sort of overview of what we're doing at Bradford. So I work in the Division of Medical Engineering in the School of Engineering. And you can see from the sort of expertise there, I'm alone sort of research in the field of gait, uh, movement biomechanics. Most of my colleagues are kind of more on the tissue engineering side. Um, and in the past it's been great, but you know what it's like when you go between projects and all your postdocs disappear. It's like, wait, what's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? I'm kind of in that situation at the moment. Um, so we're, we've been doing sort of medical engineering for many, many years. We're one of the oldest and largest in the country. We've got um, sort of these different programs. So the main one is the uh, BNG, MNG in medical engineering. We usually have about sort of 30 students. And if they're good enough, they, get, they carry on onto the MNG program. We've just stopped um, the, the clinical engineering. It was affiliated by NHS. Um, they promised placements, but they didn't deliver, so it proved too difficult. So at the moment, we've stopped that course. So yeah, that's uh, kind of where I am. I work from a small lab, uh, about half, half the size of this room. I was going to put pictures up, but I thought, compared to what you've got here, <laughs> it would look a bit, uh, yeah. So what we're going to talk about today, I set the scene. So we know prosthetics is not necessarily new. It's been going for a long, long time. Sort of the early evidence dates back to uh, way, way back, Egyptian mummy. There's I've seen a recent paper on this suggesting it's not just for burial purposes, there was actually functional benefits. I think someone's tried to prove that people walking in this thing actually got some gait benefits. But nowadays, of course, we use online, real-time microprocessor control, adaptive technology. And this is just the ones that are clinically available. Obviously, there's research on it from down at this university on sort of the next generation, you know, involving haptics and whatever. So these developments seem that computers integrated into prostheses is raising new standards of function for amputees. Sorry about that. But every time we have a new development, we have to have convincing evidence that it works. Does it provide some benefit to the patient? I used to work in a gate lab in a um, limb fitting centre and the first thing the, the consultant would say was how much would it cost? They have their limited budget, they have almost no money to, to buy prostheses. Um, so if they're going to invest or they're going to give these things to patients, they need to be compelling evidence that it works. So this sort of work that I'm going to talk to you about today is some of the methods I've used to try and get this, this evidence. You know, does it provide the benefits? And is it convincing enough? Of course, if, if you can show there's this, uh, benefits to these devices, then that actually drives the development. So this information, I work closely with a, um, a prosthetics manufacturing company. The results get fed back to them, even if they're not published. Um, and it drives development, so there's stuff that we're kind of thinking about for the future. So what I'm going to talk to you today about, concepts of prosthetic function. I'm sorry if you already know these things, um, but just a quick overview of that. I'm going to highlight some of the reason, reasoning behind the outcome measures I've used in these various studies. <coughs> Share and discuss some of the research findings. Um, from, from the last three or four years. Talk about some of the current work um, that I'm doing, hopefully doing in the future. 
So, prosthesis then, <coughs> for a transtibial amputation, and every time I use a, an abbreviation, I've got the expansion there, in case you get a bit lost. So for transtibial, what, what we're trying to do is replicate foot and ankle function. That's in the simplest terms. So what do we need to replicate from the foot and ankle? Joint simulation, shock absorption, stable weight bearing, base of support, and muscle simulation. Sounds easy. Mo well, all of these requirements I've list listed there are specific to stance phase. So we can talk about the sort of the three rocker model of gait. So the prosthesis needs to replicate the function of each of those rockers. The latest generation probably also have a benefit for swing phase, and I might touch on that through the talk. So traditional prosthetic feet, the satch foot, um, solid ankle cushion heel. So there's not much high tech in there. There's a cushioned heel, a lump of rubber essentially, and then there's a keel to provide the stability as you roll over and it's usually fixed to the prosthesis rigidly. I, there's no ankle device at all. So essentially the way it works, at heel contact, this wedge of rubber compresses and that simulates plant flexion. So plant flexion, uh, so you can get foot flat. Once you can get the foot flat on the ground, you can then weight the limb sort of safely. The stance stability as you roll over the foot, following foot, foot flat, that wooden keel stops you falling over the foot. Obviously, the longer the keel is, the more stable it would be, and perhaps less functionally beneficial. But the device has no elastic components, so there's no energy return. However, it's very cheap to produce, so it's still probably the most widely used type of foot worldwide. When I say type of foot, I mean the other one um, that's kind of linked with such foot is the Jaipur foot, made out of old rubber tyres, and it's made in some back street in India, and sells by the millions. So these type of foot feet are still the most widely used. <coughs> they work, they don't break down that much. They're cheap to replace even when they do. However, for sort of amputees who want a bit more from their, from their prosthesis, these energy storing and return or dynamic response feet have been developed. So they use smart materials, so typically carbon fibre. So when they load during weight, weight acceptance, they're storing energy some of that energy can be released or returned back to the amputee. That's the, that's the theory of them. <coughs> so at heel contact, weight acceptance, you have a heel keel that deflects, deforms, and that uh, provides shock absorption. And then as you roll over the foot onto the, onto the uh, forefoot keel, you're deflecting, deforming that keel, stores elastic energy, so as you're then go into uh, terminal stance, it should give you some pushback. By the way, if, if you want to stop me at any time from ask questions, I'm quite happy. So, over the last 10, 15 years, there's been lots of studies showing that these type of things do actually give something beneficial to amputees. They do seem to give or reduce the energy cost of walking. And because of that, there's a whole, whole raft of di um, different designs out there. Can I, can I ask a question? They'll be expensive. They are certainly so more expensive. So how often, so just general prescribing in, um, in, a, in a clinic, how often are, are these dynamic response feet prescribed? It's a very good question, um, and it's, it's not an easy answer. Obviously, most amputees are elderly people. Elderly people don't want to have a foot with too much um, instability. 
these types of feet can feel unstable. So they prefer the, the more sort of you know, satch type foot. So it's only sort of young, vigorous uh, individuals who want these, and they represent you know ten percent of the amputee population. So the other thing is the way these things are um, sort of budgeted for. So a limb fitting centre has a fixed budget. So they will have say I don't know, let's say three hundred thousand um, pounds a quarter or maybe even a year, I know it's quite low, and they have to look after all their patients. So if they fit a high-tech limb to one patient, then there's not much money left for everybody else. So that's why you have to have sort of compelling evidence. Um, so with the, um, these types of feet and the satch foot, as I was saying before, the Deformation at heel contact allows the foot to simulate plant flexion, so you get foot flat. Problem is with these feet that when you're walking on ramps, particularly down ramps, the, the heel section can't deform enough to get the foot flat. And because of that, the amputee will make compensations to get the foot flat. Some of those com compensations, i.e. increased knee flexion, if you increase your knee, and get the foot, foot flat on the on the ramp can destabilise gait, particularly if it's a transfemoral amputee. So this is one of the main reasons that um, ankle mechanisms have been developed. Seems a simple solution. The simplest form of ankle joint is just a simply a rubber ball joint. So these are multiflex feet, so kind of a satch type of foot uh, with a multiflex ankle. So they actually can articulate in all directions, and the resistance to articulation is determined by the stiffness of the rubber. One problem is that you can feel like you're going to fall forward over the foot. So the way around that, uh, I'm not going to press that thing for the laser point. The way around that is the sort of um, the socket in which the ball of rubber fits is tailored to it's called a dorsiflexion stop. So as you start articulating forward, this will actually butt up against the foot and it will stop the articulation. So you don't fall forward over the foot. But flex feet or flex ankles can feel unstable. So for most people particularly because they're elderly, they still prefer the, um, the rigid attachment. <coughs> Hydraulic ankle devices have recently become available. Uh, and essentially, the first generation are passive devices. So, I have a, I've got one here. So we have the same dynamic response foot. So that these, these get sold, these are 120 pounds, I think. Um, yeah. but once you put a hydraulic unit on there, it becomes a lot more expensive. So it's essentially the same elastic components, so you still get that um, you know, spring stiffness, shock absorption, and some potentially energy return in the, in the forefoot um, keel. But it also articulates. And you can see it doesn't articulate that much. So it's about 15 degrees. Any more, probably the empty would feel a bit unstable. There's a little adjustment screw here. You can change the hydraulic resistance to plant flexion and dorsiflexion separately. So the way it's typically set up is um, to optimize for an individual's walking pattern and walking speed. There's an interesting story behind these uh, developments. It was um, hydraulic feet have been tried out for years and years and years. And they kind of, the concept worked, but the actual technology all used to uh, break down and start leaking. So after you know, a few, few months of use, it would leak, the rubbers would degrade. So the company linked up with a 
um, a manufacturer of guided missiles. And these guided missiles, obviously, you need to have absolute precision engineering to make sure this missile doesn't go off somewhere else. And they say, yeah, we can help you out with these things. And the collaboration being so successful, they don't, they no longer make guided missile devices, they only make prosthetic devices. <laughs> but the thing is really neat. So they're the passive devices. <coughs> and the latest uh, generation, essentially you've got the same device, but rather than having the adjustment where that's set by the prosthetist, by patient feedback for their customer speed walking, you've got a microprocessor that control the resistance of the plant deflection and dorsiflexion according to the speed the amputee walks at. Sounds great, but how, you know, what's it using for the control? So there's, the device has onboard sensors, so it detects foot, foot contact, foot off, um, the sort of bending moment on the prosthesis, etc. So, what I'm going to talk to you about, some of the results I've got, is a series of studies we undertook at Bradford to look at the biomechanical benefits of walking with this hydraulic device. And yes, I'm, I'm sorry to say there wasn't any elderly individuals, they're all quite young, healthy. Probably the maximum age was maybe 55. Um, so this uh, was work was funded by EPRC, EPSRC. I got a fun first grant, which brought in a postdoc and a doctoral training award, and it was undertaken in collaboration with Blatchfords. So we're talking about um, the different feet. They, as I've already highlighted, they have the same um, dynamic response bit, by the passive sort of elastic bit underneath. The hydraulic device weighs more. It's quite a heavy thing because of the hydraulic um, fluid in there. It also must dissipate energy. That's what hydraulics do. So it's not clear why these devices would provide a benefit yeah, from a theoretical point of view. When, the, when amputees try them out, they say, oh, this is, I like this, can I have it? Of course, that's not compelling evidence for the consultant. <laughs> Anything that, I think these devices will probably be £1,500 at the, ch the passive one, mm. probably £3,000 for the microprocessor. And if you tell an amputee that device costs that much, of course they want it. They're bound to say it, you know, it's a good, a good device. So the first study we did was to investigate how the centre mass progresses over the, over the foot. So we know that uh, if you sort of draw a, a Pedotti diagram, it kind of gives you a qualitative um, insight into how you roll over your foot during gait. So we thought that could be something we could look at. And we looked at the literature, and there's been some studies showing that for amputees, as they roll over from heel to toe, it seems that the centre of pressure gets stalled under the hind foot. And the anecdotal um, sort of feedback from amputees is that they feel like they're having to climb over the foot. So that sort of feeling of having to climb over the foot, stalling the centre of pressure, it might be because these devices, um, so this heel, heel keel, it's um, matched to body weight. So the different stiffnesses, also of different size feet, obviously we all have different size feet. But the main thing that's going to determine the deflection is, this, is the stiffness. So. It's obviously fixed, that can't change during locomotion. Um, so there could be certain instances that you deflect this fully and therefore you're almost bottoming out on the prosthesis and that provides a bit of a jolt. 
And that could be why amputees uh, complain of having to climb over the foot. And with this hydraulic device, um, that experience, so amputees were telling us, uh, disappeared. So we thought we've got to look at uh, how, they, how the centre mass um, progresses over the foot. So we sort of, the thrust of the study, does use of the hydraulic ankle foot device facilitate body weight transfer? We did some pre preliminary work. We know uh, the work by Hansen and uh, uh, Childress, that this rollover shape. There seems to be a whole raft of papers looking at uh, rollover shape. Um, it seems to make sense. It's essentially a process where you transform the Central pressure into the shank base coordinate system. Sounds great. Um, and then what you end up doing is having this um, central pressure in the shank coordinate system, and that determines this sort of, you imagine you roll over your foot, that's the shape of that rollover. So we tried that, and we didn't get data quite the same as uh, what's been published, and we wondered how they did it. Uh, we tried it all different sorts of ways. Um, of course, if you, if you have, you know, collecting at 200 hertz, you have lots of data points. If you take out some of those, it's quite easy then to fit some sort of curve to it. Um, so we, we weren't sure how to progress with that one. So instead, we assess transfer of body weight onto the limb by quantifying changes in the central pressure trajectory and velocity. And for the rollover, we evaluated how the shank rolls over the foot. So 20 participants were recruited. They all had uh, feet with habitual uh, feet with rubber or fixed ankle. Got them to walk over the force platform at um, freely chosen feet, uh, speed in two, two blocks. So habitual foot hydraulic foot, and that was obviously counterbalanced. When we changed the foot, um, they only had one or two hours of familiarity. We have tried it the other way, sort of fix, put them in a new foot, send them out for two, two or three weeks, <coughs> ask them to come back. Um, obviously that might be a preferred approach, but they don't always come back. And then of course there's problems with, you have to sort of you know, for fair comparisons, you should really do it at the same time of day. You've got to make sure they are probably at the same thing and not drunk the day before. And I think there's issues with both ways. And for a lot of the work we've done as well, we've quite often recruited people who have the hydraulic foot used habitually, and then we've sort of counterbalanced it that way. So the habitual foot is counterbalanced, if that makes sense. So the out outcomes... So walking speed, obviously that's the main one. And then the peak positive and negative AP, central pressure velocity. Also this, um, the total negative central pressure displacement. Obviously if there's a bit of stalling, potential that stalling would move the central pressure back. So we looked at how much uh, negative displacement there was. And then the mean shank velocity during weight transfer onto the processor then. So here, I've missed out one. Why isn't there? There is actually a picture there, believe it or not. Okay, that was going to be the centre of pressure trajectory for the different feet conditions. Essentially, when we looked at the progression, we could see the centre of pressure did actually move backwards when using the rigid foot. And on average, um, it was significantly reduced backwards movement and centre of pressure, pressure when, the, when our participants transferred onto the hydraulic foot. So, I don't know why it hasn't come up. And the you can see it here anyway. So this is um, the centre of pressure of velocity underneath the foot. So it's in the forward backwards direction. So this is the eventual foot and this is the hydraulic foot. And then we've got plus or minus one standard deviation for a group of able, 
everybody controls. So at foot contact, what you want to do as you as your foot goes flat, the centre of pressure would move forward quickly underneath the foot, which is why you get this peak here. You can see the peak is um, slightly delayed for the prosthesis and for the amputee user compared to the um, able body controls. And that makes sense. Obviously, we've got active muscular control. This relies on some sort of deformation of the foot. Interestingly, with the hydraulic foot, it's not delayed quite so much as with the rigid foot. The other thing that happens is you've got this negative velocity. So obviously, air under the curve there, that would represent a negative displacement of the centre of pressure. So these stalling of the centre of pressure um, was reduced, if not eliminated, when the participants transferred onto this hydraulic foot. So is that going to mean that they are For, for these people? Yeah. Yes. I'll come on to that, actually. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, that, I mean, that would represent... Yeah, well, I've got some slides to talk about that more. So, the shank angular velocity during weight varying and walking speed increase using the hydraulic foot. So, the, that first study, then, indicated that the use of the hydraulic foot attenuates fluctuations and facilitates transfer of body weight onto the prosthetic limb in a smoother, less faltering uh, manner. And that's probably why walking speed increased. So it's, you know, what you're saying with the rigid device, it almost, it puts the brakes on and they have to then put a bit more energy back into that. So, yeah. so the next study we did was Obviously, the first step was all about centre of pressure, which is kind of reflecting what's happened to the central mass. So we wanted to know exactly, you know, is there more energy having to be put into the system? So what we initially did was to look at the joint kinetics. So we know from the literature, um, unilateral amputees use different joint kinet kinetic adaptations, i.e. compensations, to allow them to walk. For instance, increased sound limb ankle work in late stance uh, and increased redu residual limb hip work in early stance, which kind of makes sense. If you're pushing off from your prosthesis, you've got no active plant reflection. So you can't do that. So what you do on the, on the residual side, you do increased hip work to pull yourself onto the limb, which makes sense. And then when you're in the other way, um, prosthetic limbs there, you probably do more work from the intact ankle to compensate for the lack of in, uh, ankle work on the prosthetic limb. And these adaptations increase with walking speed. <coughs> so with the findings from study one, we realised the um, use of the hydraulic foot facil facilitates transfer of body weight onto the prosthetic limb, so kind of suggests that the joint kinetics would be or well, the adaptations would be reduced. So that was the aim of this second study. So for fair comparison, uh, did exactly the same for, um, had the, the same um, dynamic response for. You know, I, sh I should have said that before actually. But for the first study, um, 20 participants, they, their feet uh, was a rigid, attached or, or, or um, rubber ankle foot, but they, don't, they didn't all have the same dynamic response foot. It was a variety of things, or a variety of different types, I should say. But this one, they all use the same type of dyna dynamic response foot. So if we're looking at joint kinetics and calculating joint kinetics, how do you actually do that for a prosthesis that doesn't necessarily have an ankle? If you imagine this, this foot is rigidly attached to the shank, it simulates plant deflections or deflection by the deformation of the keels of the feet. So in other words, it doesn't have an ankle joint. This one has an ankle device, 
but it also has the cables going on. The deformation of the cables going on. So where would you locate an anchor point? So that was the first thing we thought about. So I guess from from knowing this um, might be the reason why lots of previous studies have actually assumed prostheses do have an ankle. I think it's also easier to assume because the marker set you can use is kind of the one you'd use for an able-bodied person. But where to locate the ankle? So one thing we thought about was we know the, this new method for defining joint centres is functional joint centre approach whereby you're tracking two adjacent segments in 3D space, seeing how they rotate and how they rotate. You're saying, well, they rotate in by a fixed point and that fixed point, well, it's not a fixed point, the common point is the functional joint centre. And we saw in the literature that, that uh, there had been a study of looking at functional joint centres uh, for different types of prosthetic feet. So there's a white marker up there. There's an anatomical joint. Uh, I think that was a marker placed on there. And then all these feet compared to that, you can see nowhere near the sort of where you'd put a marker. And that makes sense. Most of the feet, in fact, probably all those feet there are rigidly attached. So all that is showing you is where those points of deflection are of the heel keel and the forefoot keel. But anyway, we thought we'd, we'd try it. And we found that for the rigid, at different speeds, the ankle sort of centre, which was three centimetres anterior of the actual anatomical, ante uh, uh, anatomical ankle. But for the hydraulic, things seemed to change. So how the foot was deforming the keels were deflecting seemed to change with speed. So we realised we you know, putting an ankle joint there to determine ankle kinetics would be a sort of a flawed approach. So again looked at literature and, and looked at different ways that we could look at ankle kinetics or foot kinetics for the prosthetic side. And we found an old approach um, so it's been used a few times since but it essentially eliminates the foot and the ankle just has some sort of blob which, they, which is referred to as a unified deformable segment so essentially what's going on here determines how the um, sorry, one bit forward determines how the uh, end of the prosthetic shank interacts with the ground. So by sort of eliminating all that and just seeing how the this end of the prosthetic shank interacts with the ground, you can look at the kinetics of that point. So that's the approach we, we used. So translational um, power was essentially the vertical force times the vertical velocity of the point at the end of the shank plus the horizontal components of that. Rotational was the moment um, applied to that point, multiplied by the angular velocity of the shank. And then total, you add those two together. And then for total power flow, um, essentially looking at all the, the negative bits, or all the positive bits. So we know, you know power is essentially a scalar thing, but most joint kinetic studies actually separate positive and negative to give an indication of you know, um, power flow into and out of the out of the limb or the limb segment, I should say. So eight participants participate in this study, uh, all habitually used a spring foot. They walked across the force platform uh, three speeds. Always start with customary, then slow and fast, which was counterbalanced. And then the foot order was counterbalanced as well. 
So, collected segmental kinematics, um, determined functional joint centers for the physiological joints, and then for the prosthetic end, we use the two formal segment approach, um, standard inverse dynamics for the physiological joints, and then for the rigid, oh, sorry, the residual knee, obviously it's an intact joint, but for the distal end, um, we didn't want to use the modelled kinetics determined for the end of the prosthetic um, shank, so instead we assume that to be one rigid segment and use the distal ground reaction forces to work out the kinetics for the uh, residual knee. So main outcomes, moment of power peaks at the joints uh, and the power integrals. So for able body gait, that's the typical sort of power curve for the ankle joint. So you can see for two thirds of um, stance period, the ankle absorbs power. Um, obviously at foot contact, it's controlling how the foot lowers to the ground. And then the initial part, you're, you're slowing down how quickly the shank rotates over your foot. And then toward terminal stance, front flexor activate strongly to propel yourself forward, which is associated with positive power. So that's kind of what we're, uh, what you're looking for from the ankle. For the prosthetic end power, we got this sort of shape, which is kind of roughly the same. So for most of the first two thirds of the stance period, it is absorbing. Um, power. The only difference is you've got this P2 power, positive power burst. Um, so it, biphasic, which is not uh, evident for able-bodied locomotion. So it represents inappropriately timed energy return. And I guess well, the way we thought about it would be seems to make sense. At foot contact, you deform in the heel keel, store some elastic energy as you roll over the foot. Probably the heel keel um, returns energy. So it gives you a little bit of kick. But potentially that little kick could destabilize sort of stance phase. Give you a little boost of uh, energy return when you don't want it. The, so the foot comparison, so that was perhaps the ankle comparison is a better way to say it. This, this is for two different participants. And essentially what we were finding with the hydraulic uh, foot, it absorbs more and returns less energy. So this sort of dotted line here and here is reduced when using the hydraulic foot. And because this line is lower, obviously that's the reason it absorbs more. So it's attenuating that sort of inappropriately timed energy return. Load and response knee flexion, prosthetic limb load, bearing and residual knee work were greater with the hydraulic. So it seems whatever the foot was doing, it had a positive impact on what the uh, joint above the foot was doing. It involved the knee more. But there was no difference in intact ankle work between foot types. Um, hip work on both limbs increased with speed increases. That was a bit of a surprise. We thought this compensatory intact ankle work might be reduced with the um, with the hydraulic foot. However, with the hydraulic foot, all three speed levels were higher. So they walk quicker at slow, customary and fast with the hydraulic foot compared to the rigid. So we reanalyzed our data by normalizing into walking speed. So now we're getting the kinetics, uh, so the work, joint work per meter traveled. And we found that 
that um, that did reduce using the hydraulic foot. So the top bit is saying there was no difference, but that's in absolute terms. But they're walking quicker, so when you normalise it, they're actually doing less work per metre travelled at the end. So it seems the hydraulic device reduces the speed-related compensatory intact work. And this was despite um, the device dissipating more energy. So the hydraulic device must dissipate more energy. And it kind of suggests energy return. So if it's absorbing more and returning less, it's kind of suggesting energy return is not necessarily the key design criteria for dynamic response feet. Lots of developments in prosthetic feet, and it's kind of a, a basic sort of guide as being spring is king. The more energy return you can get into these devices, the better, but maybe that's not right. So the next study we did, uh, we wanted to look at walking efficiency. So this is essentially the ratio of segmental energetics to the metabolic costs of locomotion. So reduction in intact limb, ankle work, and combined joint works per meter travels uh, from the previous study suggests there should be a metabolic saving when using the hydraulic foot. However, obviously that might be negated the fact that the hydraulic device is almost half a kilogram heavier and the device dissipates energy. So we weren't 100% sure if um, walking efficiency would be improved. So this time nine unilateral amputees were recruited. By the way, with these um, participants, we don't have a limb fitness centre in Bradford, so we had to sort of use networks. Um, so the hospital I used to work at was in Manchester, so we went there, it's the biggest centre in the country, which was good. Obviously it's out, out, uh, out of um, West Yorkshire, so we thought we'd better recruit from the, from the Yorkshire area. So the other centre we went to was Sheffield. The protocol this time was uh, treadmill walking. So there was five speeds, customer speed, then 80 to 160% of that. And then also two um, decline. So we're walking on a decline at customary speed, o speed only. One problem we had with this is that the treadmill didn't decline. <laughs> I was going to ask about that. I'm not sure if I've been on a declining treadmill. <laughs> but it did go backwards. Ah. <laughs> so we inclined it and turned it around. <laughs> <and> it <laughs> so it worked all right. How many engineers have you taken with that? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, I think for the ladies' one, we're going to we're going to actually prop up the back end of the, and then yeah, we've worked it out. If you prop up the back end and then put it on elevation, you can actually start level, yeah. right. and then press the button. And, yeah. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so outcomes metabolic cost. So there's O2 uh, consumed per meter travelled, and then we tracked three D segmental um, kinematics and determine, or use this as an approach to determine internal mechanical work, which is the sum of the positive increments in kinetic energy of each segment, all the limb segment and the head trunk. And then the external work is the sum of the positive increments in kinetic and positive energy of the center of mass. And then from those, you can work out recovery index. So for this, um, I hooked up with Graham Askew from Leeds. Uh, he does this sort of work with with uh, chickens, actually. He's looking at <laughs> <laughs> chicken game. But he, he, some of these um, some of these data analysis, you know, I didn't want to reinvent the wheel. I knew Graham was w actually working with my old PhD supervisors, and uh, they'd already got these programs. So I thought a good guy to hook up with. And then efficiency, the ratio of the total positive mechanical work to the metabolic cost. So what I mean by that, when you load the foot, we know the ground reaction force is located backwards. 
when you're walking on the prostheses because the potentially this bottling them out perhaps is um, you know if it stalls the centre of pressure you're increasing this braking effect so if the high using the hydraulic foot removes this you don't have to um, make up so the centre of mass work is uh, is reduced so we thought we'd do a study to actually prove this once and for all. So all this stuff was speculation. It's a good way of sort of saying, well, it does make sense, but can we actually get the evidence for that? So we actually tried to, well, the focus of this, this study was to look at the centre of mass dynamics. So we did a retrospective analysis of the data we'd already collected for trans tibials, and we got comparable data for transfemoral amputees. And essentially, we looked at the centre of mass um, forward velocity. So this would be um, you know, foot contact through to toe off. So you can see the centre of mass after foot contact initially increases. So this is a area here. But that makes sense when you contact the ground or you've been pushed on onto the limb by the other by the other limb. And then this breaking effect slows the centre of mass velocity down and then as you go get forward of your limb you can then start falling forwards and your foot should push you so the centre of mass increases again and what we, sh what we found was the hydraulic, when you're using the hydraulic foot you don't slow down quite so much so it was sort of quite convincing evidence that it's, a, it's attenuating the centre of mass dynamics And kind of, it's almost a key finding from this series of studies. I mean, they've all been published, but actually, this is probably the biggest message to get across, um, particularly to the manufacturing world, that maybe you don't need to concentrate on putting big springs on, on the prostheses. It's how you reduce the braking effect from the limb. This goes to your question earlier, uh, Lynn, in terms of most amputees are elderly, absolutely. So most are due to vascular problems. Um, however, you know, because we're a nation that likes to push above our weight or fight above our weight, we, we are involved in sort of conflict around the world. Um, we don't have so many industrial accidents anymore, but we do have um, road accidents. So we still have 10% of the amputee population uh, due to trauma. So this is young, otherwise healthy individuals. And obviously that's year after year. So the sort of, we have about 5,000 current um, amputees. And in the USA, this is considerably higher. So there's a lot of amputees out there who could benefit from these types of devices. And the company is one that in, I, I collaborate with, you know, Blatchford, they're one of the world leading manufacturers. So they're not just targeted in this country, they're targeted in America and, and in other countries as well. Um, because it's, say for instance, America, where it's all healthcare is based on you know, um, the Medicare system, actually. They, although they have lots more money, they want more evidence to say, is this device better than the other one? So it's more important than other countries. So they didn't automatically prescribe one of the most expensive limbs. They, they really want justification. There's need justification, yeah. yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. And I think in other countries, like France and Japan, you know, it's it's even more rigorously in, in um, you, you know you have to have that evidence. It has to be published. It has to be objective. And it's yeah. more like a bespoke prescription, really. That's essentially what you're saying. You need a bespoke prescription. You need to take each individual and, and look at what their needs are because it can, could make could be dangerous giving someone too damaged. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The people who have got the best prostheses in this country are, are you know, war victims. I was going to say, last 
trauma, yeah. I would have thought, is, is, um, is, is and then that's often where there's most development and processing for in many ways, isn't it? Just well, in the, those sort of it, well, it, I guess it's developed for these individuals. Yeah. Um, but uh, will it continue? I mean, it's, there's been a political campaign, Help for Heroes and whatever, because it's, it's not NHS who's funding these limbs yeah. for these individuals. It's, it's Ministry of Defence and Help for Heroes, that type of thing. And they'll probably have three or four limbs that they, they use, even if they don't want them. Oh, yeah, it's a, a new limb, I'll have it. Um, but they could be getting a, a limb that from what yes. you're saying. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And so are the manufacturers taking on board this advice you're giving them about how you evaluate how someone walks should be different, shouldn't they? Yeah, yeah. And you know, we, to do these studies, we have to have, to have a prosthetist um, to set the limbs up. And, and the, the guy who usually comes up is the consultant prosthetist does all the difficult cases around the country. So, you know, he knows and he tells you know, all the staff around the country there's no point putting, you know, these high-tech limbs or higher tech. I mean, this is, this is quite an old uh, limb now compared to some of the microprocessors and things. But there's no point putting it on to these elderly patients. They're not going to get any benefit. Perhaps, in fact, the opposite. Um, Sorry, just one, one other comment. Yeah. I wonder how much, how much the findings of this relate to the use of AFOs in stroke. So there must be some translation, don't you think, to um, an AFO technology? Yeah. And there's that thing about whether you have a rigid book rigid or whether you have a carbon fiber one that gives yeah. you a bit of push yeah. or whatever, and how that is evaluated is probably on the same lines, but you, your movement around the ankle will be different and it's controlling moments around the knee as well, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Is, is it uh, that um, in your sort of conclusions you're saying the spring is not key? It looks like it's not so much. Uh, 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 well, I'm saying you, you need spring, but it's not not the main focus. When you actually have that return? Yeah. I'm just wondering if you actually had that return later in the stent, you would actually not have that big deceleration of the centre of mass, and you'd actually have the benefit of it. Yeah. Well, if you go back to the uh, kinetics I presented for the prosthetic end, I mean, there was a big uh, power return. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there was a, a terminal stance, which was almost as big as what you get from the intact limb. So it is given that. But the point I'm making with that it's spring is keen, it's the manufacturers have been sort of focused on, oh, yeah, yeah. you yeah. need to put more spring return in there. Yeah. But in actual fact, it may not be the most important thing. That's all I'm saying. You still have to have it. But concentration should be placed on how you roll over the foot and maybe there's breaking effect and whatever. And you're talking about walking. Have you done the same thing with running? Does it change again? Um, I haven't. Um, the lab's not big enough. <laughs> I mean, the lab's only this big. <laughs> uh, so, um, I'm a, I don't know how much you want me to carry on. I've got just a little bit of what uh, I'm currently involved in, which is... We've done a little bit of work on the microprocessor control version of that, um, but this is more exciting, holistically functioning uh, above knee prosthesis. So, are you happy for me to continue? Yeah. I might have to leave, but I'll listen to okay. this. So, microprocessor controlled knees have been out there for many years. I actually did a MSC work up in Strathclyde, I don't know, 20 years ago, on the first microprocessor controlled knee, which was just a swing phase control device. Um, so they've been around for a long time. Uh, more recently, the hydraulics have been introduced. So the hydraulics are for stance, phase control. The pneumatics is usually just for swing phase control. Um, they proved beneficial for amputees, transfer amputees, but they do have some limitations. And one way I thought to, to uh, emphasize this is just to show you what happens for terminating gait. So if you look at the center of pressure trajectory during gait termination, it's kind of the inverse of what you see for gait initiation. So this would be 
stopping limb, obviously the centre pressure goes underneath there, and then as you bring this one here, centre pressure, and eventually the stable starts. So you get that sort of, you know, classical centre pressure trajectory for terminating um, locomotion. For amputees, transfer, particularly transfemoral amputees, they don't get this um, forward displacement. It sort of stops halfway. And that makes sense because they don't have an ankle, a functional ankle joint. So it's limited by the sort of lack of ankle joint. However, the problem with that is if you think about this, this must re represent where the ground reaction force is. It's kept closer to the heel, which is essentially more likely to be behind the knee joint. If it's behind the knee joint, it can unlock the knee and potentially cause sort of instability. And this becomes more of a problem you know, on slopes in your terminating gait. So, um, for trans tibial amputees, the microprocessor of control version does actually have a mode for walking on ramps where you actually allow the foot to get foot fat quicker and that centre of pressure should actually move forward on the foot um, quicker when terminating stance. And we've actually showed that does work. Is that automatically switching? It's automatically switches in. Right, when I say automatically, it takes two steps. Right. Yeah. What it doesn't do, though, it won't do it on treadmills. <laughs> because of the sensors, right. they re they're sort of, um, they require, you know, when you put your foot on the ground, the foot has to be stationary. Obviously, with the treadmill, it gets moved backwards. So we've had to build ourselves the ramp uh, in the lab. So for transtibial, they use this sort of device. Um, but obviously, if you integrate that into a transfemoral prosthesis, it has to, you know, it can't work independently because it might negate what's happening at the knee joint. So the latest limb systems or latest developments are these limb systems that try and coordinate the ankle and knee together. They've been available commercially for about a year uh, in this country anyway. So I'm calling them holistically functioning prostheses. I don't think the manufacturers call them there. They call them all sorts of names. So it's simultaneous microprocessor control of those two joints. And it sounds fantastic, but you know, the engineers have to come up with algorithms to put into these devices. Um, and you know, what are the, you know, you can almost think, well, walking at different speeds, you kind of know what's going on, but what about the other activities they're involved in? So the first thing we thought about doing was to try and find out what locomotor activities are MPDs mostly involved in. So this data was collected by, from sensors on the prosthesis and it was downloaded during sort of routine ma maintenance. And these are the type of activities. So speed changes, that makes sense. Um, stairs, obviously that makes sense. And ramps. Um, but this stop starts was a bit of a surprise. But it, only because probably you don't think about it. Obviously the many times as you walk, you've got to start and stop. But obviously, up to well, quite recently, how you stop and start with prosthesis, you hadn't really been thought about by the manufacturers. So these limb systems are programmed with various modes. <coughs> so, for example, ramp, stair descent, speed changes. There's also um, trip detection. And this is actually coming from. Um, They've been in knee systems for quite a while, actually. So when you feel like the knee's going to collapse because you hadn't put your, your foot in the right place and it kind of the ground reaction force is trying to unload the knee, there's a detection for any rapid knee flexion and it just puts the brakes on. So, you, yeah, you'd probably get a bit more flexion, but it should be rigid enough to stop you falling over, which is a big which is a problem transfemorals have had for many years. So these modes 
are activated based on you know, what it's sensing. So when you walk on different to a terrain, it's going to put a different bending moment on the prosthesis. So there's sort of strain gauges mounted on these prostheses. But it still comes down to you know, how, how to write these algorithms. So one mode uh, for, for ramp walking. So you want the foot to plant flex rapidly to attain foot flat. But then once it's on the ground, you want dorsiflexion resistance to increase, to slow how the, the shank rotates over the foot. Otherwise, you could fall down the ramp. So that, that's how supposedly these uh, devices are set up. And then when you terminate in the gate, as the problems I just highlighted, it can, if you get, get it wrong, you, you can uh, destabilize the knee. So they've introduced something, what they call in stop and lock, which is emphasized there. So they've stopped, so that knee device is locked. So it helps gate termination, but it also helps standing. Because obviously if you've got a knee that's going to do all these things, and if you're just standing, and it's, you know, you definitely don't want it to do anything, so it locks. So, kind of what what we're working on at Bradford is, you know, do these modes work? Do they do what the manufacturers think they do? But importantly, can they be improved? So, it's funded. Um, we've got some industrial funding. Um, I've actually got a couple of overseas PhD students who are self-funded, which is lucky for me. They're, they're working on these things. So we've done some initial work uh, looking at how they're stopping on ramps. But before we even thought about looking at does the device have any benefit to the MPT, we thought, well, how does how do we stop on ramps? And how is that affected by walking speed? Um, so we initially started with collecting data with able body controls. And then so far, I mean, the idea is obviously to collect data for amputees. So far, we've collected, I've said, it says one there, I've analysed data for one, or oh, sorry, PhD students analysed data for one, but we have collected data for two more. Uh, I, I mentioned before that these things automatically detect changes in speed and, and surface and chip into these different modes. However, it takes two steps because our lab was only this big, and our ramp had to be only. We couldn't rely on having that so many steps. So we, there is another way to supersede that. You can sort of Bluetooth and say, right, get into this mode. And the other good thing about that is you know that it's gone into the mode because you've said go into that mode. You haven't waited for the thing to react. Um, when you switch it to inactive then each of the device, you know, at the ankle and the knee, default to their sort of um, customary speed walking passive mode. So they don't suddenly collapse, is what I'm saying. So that's the ramp we, we uh, built. Um, so these are inclined wooden blocks that were bolted to the force platform. We built a, uh, a ramp walkway around it made sure there's sort of two milli millimetre gap all the way round. And then within Visual 3D, um, you can recreate the surface as a force structure. And we've got the, um, what's it called, the cow tester, to, to check that when you transfer the central pressure coordinates from the ground into the surface, you know, the, it gives you the appropriate thing. So there is a, there is a protocol uh, we follow just to make sure it works okay. Um, and what we're looking at, or well, the first thing we've been looking at, is how the centre mass velocity is reduced. So we've done this sort of plot here. So um, initial contact, second foot contact, and you'll see the central pressure, or so, sorry, the cent centre mass velocity is reduced. And our number three is probably um, that was when we considered that the centre of mass forward velocity is within a certain threshold. 
And then the next bit is how quickly do you get to a stable stance whereby the centre of pressure is stop, you know, doesn't fluctuate quite so much. So we're looking at those, and it was to see you know, how much of, that, of the velocity is reduced with the first foot, and then how much is reduced with the second foot on the ground. Um, so you can see with the increases in walking speed down the road, the contribution of the trailing limb increases and the contribution of the stopping limb reduces. Um, and then the braking impulse shows the same trend, which wouldn't be, wouldn't, would be a surprise if it didn't. So the trailing limb is more work to stop them. With increases in speed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Relatively more. Yeah. Yes. In fact, these are, yeah, they're, all, they're relative. So in absolute terms, both limbs increase a little bit, yeah. but the increase is greater for the training limb. Yeah. And it might be, because <coughs> we, we weren't quite sure about that, because you kind of think, well, if you can stop at higher speeds, you'd do more with that. And yeah, in absolute terms, you, you do, but in relative terms, you do more with that. And it might be that, there's a limit to how much you can put into the stopping limb because you're increasing speed. If you really put the brakes on, it would probably hurt your knee. So the, it might be reflected in a sort of inbuilt safety mechanism. Makes sense. So this is data for the one amputee that uh, Jake has been analysed for. So compared to microrosis on versus off. So the impulse is higher and the load rate is higher. So in other words, this sort of um, braking effect from the limb is increased when the microprocessor is on. And because of that, they're stopping quicker. Oh, this per sorry, this person. Remember, this is just pre preliminary data. We thought we'd also look at the stable stance onset um, and how that's performed. So remember what I said, it, you know, in the literature, amputees do have problems because of this lack of ankle function. Um, so this is the average over the repeated trials, and there seems to be some evidence that the centre of pressure um, runs along the foot more than the average on. That's probably to do with the ramp descent mode, allowing the foot to plant the flex quicker. And then we thought, well, another way, while well, we've got amputees in there, that some of them come, because to get transfemoral amputees, you can do these types of things. They're few and far between, so we're getting them all around the country. So they tend to come up, you know, for, a di for at least a day. So we think, well, if we house them overnight, we can have two days. So the second day, we take them up the local park and put a portable oxygen gas analysis system onto them. And I don't know if anybody's been to Bradford. We've got lots of hills in Bradford. <laughs> <laughs> and luckily, the, uh, the park has long uh, periods of fairly constant gradient um, slopes. So it's perfect. As I've said before, you can't put these guys on treadmills because the devices won't work. So we've had them. Um, so that's that's one of the guys, I guess. I think, I think it's on the level that bit. Um, so we, they can walk for at least two minutes on the level, and then about a 10 minute transition to when they turn the corner and there's two or three minutes down. And they get to steady state fairly quickly. So we're hoping it's going to um, add up to our analysis. This data from customary speed on the level, and it seems that when the microprocessors are on, there is a reduction. We kind of weren't expecting that they're in the le on the level because it's not <coughs> doing, the device shouldn't be doing anything different. So we, yeah. We're not sure about it, but as I was saying, there's only data for one person. 
And that's it. Thanks, John. Thank you. <laughs>